so today is lesson 4.4 about principles. And I'm going to do a short lecture on this book, just like I did with Seven Habits of Highly Effective People and Effective Executive. So I will summarize the really key points that I want you to take away for this. First, let's talk about this word, principles. What does that actually mean? The word principle means rule or guideline. It's a rule that you can follow to help you make a decision. That's a principle. Principles have two criteria. So first, they are timeless. In other words, no matter if you were born 2000 years ago or today, or 2000 years in the future, the principle will always hold true. So I'll give you an example. Seek first to understand, having empathy for the other person. That is a principle to solving relationship conflicts. It's always going to be true. Um, no matter if you were born 2000 years ago now or 2000 years later, you need to have empathy for the other person. So that's the first thing, it's timeless. The second thing is, um, it applies no matter where you are in the world. Okay, so it expands across all cultures. So it doesn't matter if you are Chinese or Vietnamese or American, when you have conflict with someone, you need to have empathy for them to solve the conflict. You need to seek first to understand. So that makes it a principle, okay? Whereas something like, oh, you need to, I don't know, you need to look at them in the eye when you're talking to them. That's not a principle because in different cultures, it might be rude to look at them in the eyes. I don't know, right? You're like, I think in Chinese culture, if you're talking to someone superior to you, you're not supposed to look at them in the eyes, something like that. I don't know. So that's an example of not being a principle. It will differ by culture and maybe by time as well. Maybe in the future, people don't look at each other in the eyes, who knows? Okay, so that's principle. It is timeless and it applies to all people, all cultures all around the world. That's what makes it a principle. Okay, so now we'll talk about the principles he mentions in the book. Okay, so principles for life, for a successful and happy life. Number one, he says, embrace reality and deal with it. That is the same thing. Notice how his first principle is the same as the first habit in seven habits of highly effective people. Hmm, right, that tells you this really is a principle. Different people are saying the exact same thing. The first thing we have to do is be proactive. We have to accept our reality so that we can deal with it. Um, that requires us to be aware of our reality. A lot of people are not aware of their realities. Um, they ignore their problems, they ignore their negative feelings, and they ignore their weaknesses. So that's not being proactive. We all have problems and the first step is to be aware of them and, and then we can deal with it. All right, number two, the five step process. So the five step process was basically like set your goal, um, make a plan, find out what the problems are to the plan, find solutions to the problems and then execute the plan. So this is the whole process is strategy and controlling. This five step is strategy and controlling. The key idea here though, is you need different personalities to work together. That's the thing that people don't realize. A lot of people think I can be successful on my own. Unfortunately, that's not true. Why? Because the five steps require different strengths and weaknesses. And it's, there's no way one person can be strong at all five steps. That is a key takeaway from this book. It's like, you know, people are going, why, why am I not successful? Why can't I be successful? It's because you need a team to be successful, right? You need a team to be good at the five steps. You alone will only be good at one, two, maybe three. No way are you gonna be good at four or five. So that's another big idea from this book. So I hope like, one of the lessons I learned was, oh, I need to figure out which friends can help me with which steps in this. I hope you can think of that for yourself. Which of my friends have complementary strengths that cover my weaknesses? 
So for example, I am a logic type, I'm a thinking type. So, you know, if I'm making a decision or if I'm trying to resolve a conflict, I can ask for advice from a feeling type. Be like, hey, do you think this would, you know, work well for people's feelings? Another example is I am a observant type, which means I'm not good with creativity. Like I'm not imaginative. So if I need ideas, I need to talk to my intuitive friends who are very strong at thinking of ideas and creativity. So, you know, you should think about, okay, so he, here's my strengths and weaknesses based on my personality. Who in my friendship circle can cover my weaknesses? That's a big point here for the five-step process. Okay, number three, be radically open-minded. That basically is the same thing as be humble. Okay, so there is a, um, like I mentioned before, filial piety is the first virtue as in it is number one, it is the most important. And as you can see, within filial piety, a big part of filial piety and respect is humility. Okay, so when my parents criticize me, I will listen respectfully. That is humility, all right? So being radically open-minded just means being super humble and listening to other people's ideas. Now, don't get confused though, and think, oh, a humble person actually just does whatever other people tells them to do. That's not true. If you just do whatever other people tell you to do, you're not humble, you are mindless. Like you don't have a mind of your own. So a humble person will consider everybody's logic. Okay. So even if I don't agree with you, right? If I'm humble, I will still listen to your opinion and your logic and respect your opinion, even if I don't agree with you. And the reason I don't agree with you is totally based on logic and not on emotion. Whereas closed minded people, they're just very emotional about it. They're like, I don't want to listen to your opinion because they're very emotionally sensitive about these topics. So that's the difference. Okay, number three, number four, understand that people are wired very differently. Okay, so we talked about this. All of unit one was trying to tell you, hey, all of you have different personalities, which means all of you have different strengths and weaknesses, and you should appreciate each other's strengths rather than criticize each other's weaknesses. That was all of unit one, and that's this sentence right here. Understand people are wired very differently. That's his fourth principle. Okay. Number five, learn how to make effective decisions. So this we talked about in the effective executive as well. Um, I want to comment that the decision making principles here in this book, okay, principles book by Ray Dalio, I think they go into even more detail than the effective executive. Okay, so I prefer these principles um, over the ones from the effective executive. So I personally use these ones, okay, and they overlap a lot. So he talks about like Ray Dalio talks about using logic and time-tested rules. Time-tested rules are principles, okay? And not feelings. We make bad decisions when we make an emotional decision as in a emotionally reactive decision. Like if you're angry, right? And then you make a decision when you're angry, you're probably going to regret that decision, right? Or if you are very stressed and you make a decision under stress, you're probably going to make a bad decision. We need to make decisions when we are calm and logical. That's the first point. There's a lot here, okay? So I'm only gonna mention two, that is one. And the other one is most decisions are not unique. So a lot of people, this is where we all make the mistake. We think our problems are unique to us. So for example, let's say uh, you had a fight with your mom, right? And you're like, you think that your fight with your parent is like a unique problem to you. But in reality, like people have fought with their parents, have conflicts with each other for like all of human history. And so when we think, how do I solve this conflict? We think it's so hard. We think like, yeah, how do I solve this conflict? And you're thinking about your specific situation. But principles tells us, well, why don't you just go study the people who have had conflicts with people in the past and who are able to resolve their conflicts effectively and just ask them how they did it. And that's where we get principles for solving relationships. 
Um, a lot of them, you know, we mentioned the course, like from Deeds of Gui and from Emotional Intelligence. Um, to give you another example, choosing your university and your future career, right? Most of us were like, yeah, what do we choose? It's such a hard choice. And you think it's a very personal thing. Like, oh, I need to figure out what I need to choose. But actually, if you think about it, like people have been choosing a career for like thousands of years. There's definitely principles related here. So to give you some examples, focus on purpose. The more people you can help, the better the career. That's a principle. It's always going to be true no matter what, because the more people you're helping, the more purpose you will have. The more purpose you have, the more happy and motivated you will be. The more happy and motivated you are, the more successful you will be naturally. Okay, so basically, whenever we have to make a decision, think. Have people made this decision in the past before? Can I learn from how they made those decisions in the past? That's how you use principles. Okay, idea number six, success is not fame and wealth. Um, I don't know about you. I don't know like what you guys have been taught from Hollywood media. I don't know if you watch Hollywood. So I don't know what you've been taught by like television and your culture. But I do know that when I was growing up, and I also think in Chinese culture, people equate money and fame with success, basically. So you look at you look on TV, right? And they show off people show off how much money they have how much cool possessions they have, like a nice car and a nice house and how famous they are, okay? And, and then people think, oh, that's success. That's what I want. This book tells you, no, it is not. It's about meaningful relationships and meaningful work. This is also proven through science, brain science. So meaningful relationships. If you have people that you can really count on, you're gonna be happy and um, this, this stress management lesson talked about how like meaningful relationships really help us with stress. Okay, so meaningful relationships is one and then meaningful work is the other. That's about purpose. So we talked about in motivation, serving other people, doing greater good. It's one of the reasons why I became a teacher because it's meaningful work to me. I want to help prepare and better the future generation. Okay. So that's success for you. And it's really great that Ray Dalio says this because he is super rich, like he's a billionaire and he is super successful and famous. And he is telling you, no, that is not the key to happiness, okay? I'm not happy because I'm rich and I'm famous. I'm happy because I have meaningful relationships and meaningful work. And by the way, I attained success because I chased meaningful relationships and meaningful work. The rich wealth and that fame, it just came as a byproduct. I didn't chase that intentionally. And this is a mistake people make nowadays is they try to chase money. They, you know, when they're picking a job, they're like, oh, which job can make the most money? Which job has the best reputation? Or like after they get a job right away, they're like, okay, now I need to think which, what is the next company I can jump to, to make more money, right? With that kind of mindset, you're not going to be successful. Okay, number seven, we got two more, seven and eight. So number seven talks about the two barriers to success, which are ego and blind spots, especially in turbulent types. Okay, turbulent types really have a ego problem. They're very sensitive to criticism um, and everyone has different blind spots. So how do you overcome them? Well, you can overcome them with humility. In other words, being open-minded, um, asking other people, to criticize you so that you can figure out your own weaknesses and they can help you see things that you can't see. And then also training. So we give the example of, uh, of turbulent types, okay? Being sensitive to criticism. If you practice daily reciting like these a gray line, oh, um, if other people tell me my criticisms, I will be happy and accept it. If other people tell me my good points, I will be humble and not really boast about it. If you just keep reminding yourself, like with training, daily training, you can become humble and less sensitive to criticism. Another example, I'm a thinking type, right? So I could train myself in emotional intelligence. 
in listening skills in reading other people's emotions. That's totally possible. Um, and I mentioned earlier here, number two, one of the most easiest and efficient ways, okay, the easiest way is simply find somebody who is strong in the area that you're weak. That can help you overcome your blind spot. And lastly, number eight, the root of your problems is you, not your actions. So this is a hard one for people to accept because we have a big ego. But once you realize this, you, you choose your friends very carefully. So for example, okay, let's say you um, did really poorly on an exam. You know, you, you ask yourself, oh, why did I do so bad? We would tell ourselves, oh, it's because I didn't study very well and I was very stressed and tired, right? That's being too nice to yourself. If you think about it, why did you not study very well? Oh, it's because I'm not a careful person. Okay, that's the truth. The truth is I am not a careful person. You're getting at the virtues now. That is the root of the problem. Okay, it's like, oh, why were you so stressed? Oh, it's because I procrastinated on my assignments. And, you know, these way in carefulness, it says leave ample space when turning a corner, have ample space to submit your assignments. You didn't do that. So you were not careful. And because of your lack of carefulness, you created a lot of stress for yourself. So don't be nice to yourself and be like, oh, you know, there's no problem with me. It's just that I was stressed that time. Like, no, 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 no. The problem is all in you. You were not careful. That's why you made yourself stressed. So that's the root of problems. Um, and this has been very useful for me because I've always, in the past, I'm like, okay, what am I going to do differently next time? And now I realize, no, don't tell yourself, next time I will do this differently. It's about fixing your virtues. Right. So don't say next time I will, you know, have more time to study. No, it's not going to happen. You need to fix your carefulness. So go and practice the carefulness lines from these away. And naturally your carefulness will improve. And then naturally next time you will study better. So that's an example. Okay. So those are eight key points I took away. I want you to remember from this lesson. Any questions or comments? Okay, note takers, you got it down? All right, great.